I say, after all these years, our feed prices always do follow our corn prices. I know you guys love to raise barley up here too and wheat and everything else, but you know, you get further south, corn is king and it's just alfalfa's queen, but corn's king. And uh, you know, our feed prices follow the corn price. Everything else is based off the corn price. You'll see one of the examples in here that that sets the corn price. The corn price does it right now. Corn prices are pretty soft. Let's take a trip back through memory lane. Okay, this is October 2012. What was our corn price? Just four years ago, we had six and a half dollar corn. Wow, so you put together feed meetings like this and talk about feeding cattle and you're going six and a half dollar corn, does this work? Well, calf prices are high too. So it's a margin business, right? Inputs, if it all works at the end, then it kind of works. With that, back then we had six and a half dollar corn. Alfalfa was 140 bucks a ton. Grass hay was 80, wheat mids were 250, really? Wow, distillage greens was 250. A year later, it's down to four bucks. And of course, alfalfa hay went down, wheat mids are 145, distilled grains 165, market keeps tumbling, corn follows the lead. Let's go to, yeah, 2016. And wait a minute, yeah, October 2014. And uh, corn price is 268 a bushel, and I'm going, okay, wheat mids are 92, distilled grains, I didn't remember that two years ago, our corn, our feed prices are that low. It just didn't kind of seem right. That's because our cattle prices are so extremely high, we forgot how cheap feed was, but uh, that's where it was. So you look two years later and you go, wow, we got wheat mids at 115, had $93 a ton, distillage grains at $100 a ton at the plants, corn's 290, well, that's if you're buying it, if you're selling it, what? I don't know, guys, I'm, I'm not in my location, but down around Carrington, two and a half could probably, yeah, you'd be thankful to get that. So all of a sudden it's, Pretty reasonable price feed to put through your cow. I had a call about two weeks ago from a grain farmer, and it just shows a different perspective that you have. Young guy, probably late 20s. Yeah, young guy, late 20s. Got a neighbor who's got a feed yard with a thousand head that's empty, and he's going, I got a half million bushels of corn. Can I add some value to my corn by feeding it through cattle? Well, just roughly, you say, if you got a five weight calf, you're gonna feed them up to eight weight, you might use 30 bushels of corn to do that with. And if you make $30 a head, and gave all the profit to the calf, I mean to the corn, he could make a bush of buck a bushel. And I'm going, he's just happier than crap because of that. I'm looking at it going 30 bucks a head, really? You want to do all that work for 30 bucks? He's looking to add value to his corn. It's a different perspective, but we do have cheap feed prices. That just kind of kills me. Now we're way up here in this area, right? I think that's where I am tonight. I'm from this area. And as you keep going down through here, we got a whole bunch of co-product feeds in our area. It's available, there's lots of it. It's freight to get it up here, so I'm not sure if you wanna add 10, 15, $20 a ton to everything that I have up there for your type of freight costs to have feeds up here, but we got a, a lot of different feeds available in North Dakota. Um, there is a sheet in the back of the room that has selected co-products and prices um, it's from all those feed meals that I just showed earlier on the previous slide and it's got prices and phone numbers and the phone numbers change. So if you're looking for feed and you want to buy semi loads, you can call these people up and see what type of a deal they can give you. Now the spot prices I have are outdated as soon as I hang up the phone. So realize you might get a better deal than they quote me or maybe worse, whatever the case is. Good luck. Let's do some quick Quick nutrition here. Seven weight calf eats around 3% of body weight. Of course, maybe it's only 2.6 or 2.7, but 20 pounds of feed to a seven weight calf, that's about right. Of course, of that 20 pounds of feed, if you dry it completely so it's totally dry, it's around 17.8 pounds of dry matter. We'll probably need um, that amount of energy to get into the calves, that's TDM. This is mega cows. Um, the ration should be around a 13% protein ration if you're gonna have three pounds a day gain or, or better. Now what I'm trying to say here is that the most expensive ingredient in your ration is gonna be the energy content. So if you do the math for energy, we need 14 pounds of TDM, that's total digestible nutrients. And we do the math calculation for corn, the energy content of corn, it's about a nickel a pound. So the TDM value comes over here around 70 cents a head a day, just for energy content to keep them going. Now protein, if we had to figure the protein and all that 13%, they'd need 40 cents of protein. But there's a fallacy here, and that is, this number right here contains some protein in it. When you buy corn, it's 9% protein. There's 
You paid for the energy, now the protein's for free. So if you do the math down here, you, you take the total amount of protein pounds minus what was in the corn that you bought for the energy, you gotta buy an extra six tenths of a pound of protein to make the ration balance. Well, times 18 cents a pound gives you only 10 cents. So the feed cost, the energy cost of the feed was 70 cents, the protein cost was 10 cents. Energy drives it. So if you can buy feeds that are cheaper in cost, corn, because it's higher TDN, distillers grains, because it's higher in TDN as well, plus protein, that's where you gotta focus on. Sometimes I hear people talk about protein, we need more protein in the ration. No, what you gotta remember is look at the energy content. That's your cost, that's where you get the gain from. Water's important too. It's actually really cheap. If you don't have it, it's a bad deal, but even rural water's cheap in our area, where we're at. Two cents a day isn't bad. Okay, now I got a slide here to talk about different feedstuffs and cost per pound of TDN or cost per pound of, of crude protein. Canola meal, the top line is as fed, bottom line is 90% dry matter. Um, excuse me, this is a dry basis right here. And canola meal is 90% dry matter when you buy it. So it's a 38% crude protein feed on an as fed basis. TDN is 62%, cost per ton is 178 bucks if you want to get it from Velva. Cost per pound is around nine cents, cost per pound of crude protein is 22, cost per pound of energy is $1.43. Well, let's look at wheat mids. Go across here, 100 bucks a ton. Huh, cost per pound of protein? It's not a protein source, but when you buy wheat mids, you got 18% protein in the feed, so you kind of get that for free. Look at the energy cost of that. If you take all those dollars and just divide the energy out, it comes up to about seven cents. Do the same thing with corn? Huh, corn sets the price. Wheat mids, you gotta haul home. This is gonna be uh, 290 corn, so if you got your corn at home at 250 and you don't have to haul it anywhere, you know, you get to de decrease that price even more. But you kinda see the relationships going on. Distillers grains, that's a sleeper out there. Because of the energy count of distillers grains is pretty high. Um, it actually, and they're only asking 100 bucks a ton right now before freight, and that's at Blue Flint. Um, we're at about six cents a pound. So. Energy-wise, these are cheap things, okay. Now if you look at protein, if you gotta support, give protein in the ration, what's your cheapest source of protein here? Now you know why distillers grains always talked about in our cattle rations. It just, it's a very competitive source of energy and protein, so then it works really well with all the rest of our feeds that we have, and we produce so much of it in North Dakota. If I remember right, I think we could feed 18 pounds of distillers grains to every cow for every day of the year, and we'd still have more feed to ship out of state. We have that much distillers grains. Oh, we got some unique things going on this year. Um, for 2016-17, um, there's some wheat and barley up here that's got a really high level of vomitoxin, I understand, and it's really discount. We did research at Carrington about 15 years ago on high levels of vomitoxin and barley. We fed it to backgrounding calves, finishing calves, pregnant cows, lactating cows, bred heifers. Didn't see any issue with feeding any vomitoxin in any of those. Now, it's really tough to feed calves 100% barley diet, right? So you always blend it off with some hay. So when you come up with 28 parts per million, you blend it off with the hay, it's probably down around 18, 20 parts per million. We fed those levels, didn't see any problems. Matter of fact, in one group, the bred heifer group, we actually had more bred heifers in the group that was given vomitoxin contaminated barley than the ones that weren't. I don't believe it, but it just goes to reaffirm that it's not that big of a deal, guys for feeding cattle. You can do it to horses, poultry, bison, sheep, but not pigs. That's why it's called vomit, makes them puke. So, don't, yeah. In humans, it's limited to how much we can have in a ration. It kills the head and beer uh, in the malt, so, you know. Yeah, we don't do vomitoxin for ourselves, but for cattle, if you can feed it through them, boy, that's a cheap source of feed. We had a lot of rain in my area, so our alfalfa hay is just kind of washed out. Rain washes the sugars out. The protein can stay there, but your sugar content really goes down. So um, be careful how much energy is there. We've got a lot of people that, that held, had hail damaged annual crops, and they took it for hay. We had a lot of regrowth, too, that people are trying to take for hay right now, or maybe they did a couple weeks ago, still waiting for it to dry down. Our crow product feeds are abundant. Nobody out of state's trying to take them, so... Well, they do take them, but we could use them here, too. So it's a nice thing. You know, you get away from North Dakota, you go to, like, Montana or other locations, they don't have as many cobrotic feeds as we have available as to North Dakota. Not every state has a couple of wheat mills. 
or four like we do. And the state mill and elevator is a huge, huge consumer. Now that's our own state elevator, you know. Um, anyway, in 2014 we had the same issues. Plus we had sprouted wheat and high moisture corn. This year it seems like the corn's kind of dry, but. Oh, mycotoxins. Quick little lesson on mycotoxins. They can be in, if you see mold, you might have mycotoxins. Not all the times does, do you have it. And we fed a lot of moldy feed to our cows and they seem to keep moving, but we also have mycotic abortions that can be documented. You can have animals that just don't do as well. And usually when you have mold, you have some type of heating going on in the bale, which means there's some respiration going on, which means there's some nutrients being metabolized by the molds that are growing. So there's less feed value in the hay if it's moldy. A little less. Well, you can have it tested. Go to our NDSU Veterinary Diagnostic Lab and it costs you $150. They test for a lot of different things and these are probably the worst ones. If you're down in the southern part of the nation, like Louisiana there, uh, they have some aflatoxins showing up, so there's a big concern on how, what the level there is. We never really see now aflatoxins up here. Rarely, never, almost, almost never. But we do see things like xeralanon, I just talked about vomitoxin. You know the Ralgro implants? The active ingredient in Ralgro implants is this product right here. It has estrogenic activity, so if you got some mold and you're worried about your heifers or your heifers didn't breed, maybe it's all right to go ahead and check out the feed to see just what the levels are. Now I've taken some stuff that's black and moldy and say we shouldn't feed this. Come back with absolutely no toxins. It's obviously moldy, but there were no toxins. Anybody eat blue cheese? Isn't that right? Cheese that's got the mold in it? it some molds aren't bad. How about corn smut? Can we eat corn smut? And if you're down south, Mexico, it's like a delicacy. I, <laughs> I probably wouldn't eat it. The name sounds bad, but you know. Uh, if you want a vomitoxin test, it's 50 bucks and there's numerous things you can test for. Um, you dilute it out in the ration, that's usually a solution if it's too bad. Um, I hate the idea of taking mold counts because that all that tells me is that it's moldy. If you're doing dairy cows and you want to have a target for your mold counts to be down so they increase their feed intake and eat more, that's a good thing for dairy cows. But for our beef cows, what are you going to do with your moldy hay? You're going to feed it, aren't you? Probably. So the mold counts don't really tell you anything. This will tell you if there's a problem with the molds that are up there. So I got to talk about individual differences here a little bit. We have a lot of variability in our type of calves we have out here. Go to the cell barn and look through the calves or, or what I, I do a project at Carrington where we feed calves out to finish and it's part of the Dakota Feeder Calf Show. And we just started our, what, 18th year here, October 15th. So we got a couple hundred head of calves on feed. Everybody brings in three or four head of calves. They're placed on feed and we feed them out to finish. Slaughter them in May and uh, bring you back the carcass data and how they perform during the feeding period and all that. Um, we took the top five pens of calves so that's, we average the top five pens, then I average the bottom five pens. And this is what the top five pens did. They did average 3.28 per pound a gain per day of age. And feedlot average day of gain was only 3.56. They made, well, it was a bad year last year for buying expensive calves and selling. We only lost five bucks a head on, on the top calves. On the bottom calves, and this is like 40 different group, 50 different groups of calves, they gained 3.09 pounds per day of age. And the feedlot average daily gain was only 3.7. But look at the loss. In just a half a pound of gain difference in how these calves can perform led up to a huge loss at the end of the feeding period when everybody's killed on the same day. That just kind of, a lot of variability. So if you got the type of calves that are like this, I'm kind of saying, why aren't you feeding them? If you got the calves that are like this, they got to be managed different, maybe grown, whatever you got to find a, another way to try to pull them out and get more value out of them rather than how you treat these calves. Okay. Weight gain is affected by a lot of different things. Size and age of the animal. Young animals usually gain really well. Old animals, you know, um, they might put on a lot of gain for a short period of time, like yearlings coming off of grass, but then they're kind of done. Calves keep growing if they're green or fleshy or stunted. Those never grow. Sickness infects a calf throughout the whole feeding period. They just... They get sick once, they don't perform as well as if they'd never have a bad day. We see that at our research extension center in these calves. We usually bound back and they look good and you expect some compensatory gain, but if you look at it, they're always dogging it a little bit as time goes on. Maybe, it'll, maybe you won't see it in the game, but you might see it in the marbling. 
and that might be the difference between select and choice. So yeah, it shows up. Implants work. There's a lot of different implants. I had the question asked last time, are implants really worth it? Um, yeah, one implant's worth 25 pounds of weight. Another implant could be worth 50, 75, depending upon what you're doing in the feeding program. Um, we have feed additives you can put in the feed, Optiflex, those are all put in at the end of the feeding period for 25 days. They do substantially put more weight on cattle if you're finishing cattle. Us backgrounding people don't even think about that because it's not available to us or we shouldn't use it. Uh, wind will kill calf performance, snow will hurt them, not as bad as mud will. Walking through six inches of mud really kills your performance of calves. Bedding always helps, there's been some research done at Carrington that if you put down bedding, you'll see calves are just a little more, they gain a little bit better and have higher quality grades when they go to market. So you ask how much bedding is bedding. No kidding, five pounds a day. Double it would be generous, really generous bedding. But if you do your math and you like to see calves bed down, you like to go ahead and lay down in the bedding at the same time, just, you know, that's kind of my thumb rule. If you're gonna bed down calves, if I don't wanna lay in it after I got done, I didn't do a good enough job. And that takes, on the average, five pounds. Go figure it out someday. Be surprised. If it's less than that, let me know. If it's more than that, let me know. Just kind of interesting. Okay, affected by feed, energy density. You know, grain gives you more gain because there's more energy in it than hay. There's additives we can add, monensin. Oh, that's rumensin and lasalsa, that's Bovatec. They improve feed conversion for five to 7%. Um, processing, mixing always helps too. And of course, try to avoid feed losses. Now I'll go through some rations on their costs. Okay, we're gonna deal with 700 pound steers, and we've got about 12 different rations I'll show you. And top is gonna be rations, gain, feed to gain, TDN, net energy for gain, feed cost to gain. Uh, here's a ration that's got 10 pounds of grass hay, 10 pounds of barley malt sprouts. The sprouts give some protein to the ration, as well as energy. We're gonna only get two, two pounds a day gain on these seven weight calves, given that. And uh, 45 cent cost to gain, given the prices I showed earlier tonight. If you do a mix of uh, grass hay, alfalfa hay, and, and wheat mids, that's basically two bales. Well, let's see, how is that? Three bales of grass hay to two bales of alfalfa, something like that, and you grind it in the pile, then you add wheat mids, mix it together, and feed them. You get 2.6 average daily gain if you let them eat as much as they want to eat, and the feed costs around 31 cents. It's a lot cheaper than this. As you increase the gain, you, increase the, you decrease the cost of the gain. Let's look at grass hay, wheat mids, well, you know, if you feed 12 pounds of wheat mids and no alfalfa hay, because alfalfa's got calcium in it, you're gonna have to provide calcium from another source. Wheat mids are high in phosphorus, and when you have high in phosphorus, you gotta add extra calcium, so your calcium to phosphorus ratio is one to one, or better than that, to prevent urinary calculi. Have a dead calf because of kidney stones, and you'll realize that limestone is, is a cheap thing. Okay, um, if you're gonna give 12 pounds of wheat mids, you gotta put in the limestone, 2.8 pounds a day gain, 30 cents is your cost to gain over here. Okay, well let's look at some more rations. Those are used some co-products. Here we're using corn and co-products. So six pounds of hay, four pounds of alfalfa, two pounds of corn grain, a lot of wheat mids. 2.6 pounds a day gain. You go over here, feed cost is 32 cents. Kind of like that number, 30 some cents. Alfalfa hay and corn silage. If you put up a bunch of corn silage this year and you want to feed it, well, alfalfa hay provides the protein, corn silage provides the energy. Two pounds a day gain of that particular mix and you're up to 40 cents. Now, we could add in some corn, we could add in some distillers grains and that whole thing and cheapen up the ration. I don't have an example of that tonight, but I can do rations, John can do rations, Paige can do rations. So if you have any questions, you can go ahead and go through some iterations. I use a program called Cow Bites. It's out of Alberta, Canada. It costs $50. You can order it over the internet, it works really well. It's a ration analyzer program. So you put in numbers like, oops, you put in numbers like that and say, does that meet what the animal needs? And you can quickly do the math. Okay. Um, grass hay, four pounds. Alfalfa hay, four pounds. Wheat mid, six pounds. Corn grain, six pounds. That's cheap as at 30 cents. Three pounds a day gain. 6.71 feed conversion. Yeah, not a bad ration. That's if you have access to cheap wheat mids to go along with it. Okay, here's some alfalfa hay and corn grain, 13 and seven. 38 cents is the cost to gain. The alfalfa hay is kind of expensive. Here we got alfalfa at seven pounds, corn grain at 11 and a half pounds. You gotta put in a protein sample. So let's go ahead and buy a commercial mix that's got Bovatec or Mensin in it. 38% um, crude protein, feed a pound and a half per head a day in order to get enough protein in the ration. They gain 3.1 pounds a day. It's up to 40 cents though. And now if we wanna go down here to the, uh, do one with even more corn to pick up the grain, gain to 3.4, now we're up to 33 cents. So 
I got another slide coming up later on that'll kind of prove the point. See our feed efficiencies really improved when we increased our gain. Our cost of feed increased, improved as well. Yes? Uh, when you're using corn grain, <coughs> is the corn process cracked or something? Are you thinking cracked corn? Or? Yeah. You know, I have to divert to this. We did a blog at the Carrington Research Extension Center. It's on the internet uh, today, yesterday. Today, Monday? Today's Tuesday. Shan Engel wrote up the report that said, looked at the research they did on, you revisit these topics all the time, and this one was revisited. They did the project in backgrounding and finishing cattle, and the end result was, I guess we don't need to process our grain, our corn for our calves. Okay, I used to always say if it's more than 80% grain in the diet, it can be fed as whole. Because if you grind it and feed that much grain, you're gonna have some acidosis in the calves. So by leaving it whole, you reduce the amount of acidosis and the calves perform well. I always figured in our backgrounding calves, we should be more like our dairy industry. They pulverize the crap out of their, of their corn. They make it into flour, so every bit of that corn is utilized well, but they're fighting against acidosis. We are, in the dairy industry, they add enough to that ration. There's a third corn silage, a third grain, a third alfalfa hay. They probably put in some buffers as well and some other beet pulp, you name it, everything to make a really good ration so you never have an upset stomach. They want those cows to always milk. So if we'd have that type of ration for our calves, I'd say we probably need to. But usually we're feeding enough grain where we might even be bunk feeding. I guess feeding it whole works still bugs the crap out of me when I see whole kernels in the manure. It, it always will. <laughs> but you look at the data and it'll support that maybe we don't have to. I'll still crack my own. I'm just, I can't, I, I gotta see some more data. Finishing cattle, though, that's a whole different story. If you're feeding 80 per 75 percent of the ration as whole grain, I mean as whole as grain, feed it whole. No need to process it. If you want to tweak it a little more, wet corn probably doesn't need processing compared to really dry corn, like 10 percent moisture corn. It's been dried too hard. That'll take a while for that to go ahead and sop up in the rumen and credit. Yeah, that answers the question. I guess you can go home and feed it whole. Sometimes there's research I don't want to believe, but it, you know, it, it was done well. What can I say? It's also been done in Nebraska. It's been done in South Dakota. Oh, yeah, yeah. South Dakota. South Dakota's on, on a high 80% grain ration, and yeah, they, they did see some differences when you put animals in digestion crates and collect all their manure and their urine to see how much they digest. Yeah, they found a difference. Then you put it out in the feed yard, we actually feed them. No difference. Just, yeah. Anyway, here's another one, grass hay and distiller's grains. Say so you don't have corn, but you're looking for feed. You need some protein to go with the grass hay. You need some distiller's grains, not much, but um, that'll give you a pound point seven, average daily gain, kind of like what a heifer would need. Or if you're gonna be doing uh, grass calves, your cost of gain's pretty high, but you're trying to limit their gain so later on you can, you know, uh, work it out. Uh, usually in this deal, you've got a lot of days on feed, so you know it's the whole feeding period that you're looking at too. Grass hay for 10 pounds, corn at four, distillers at six, 32, and yeah. Again, there's a lot of different ways to feed these cattle for different rates of gain. Everything kind of works. You just got to remember, you got to have energy, you got to have protein, and you got to have a little bit of roughage to keep that rumen healthy, and then move on. Um, low rates of gain work great for. Grass calves, medium rates of gains, probably grow calves well without putting too much flesh on. I'm guilty of putting too much flesh on my calves. Seems like after 80 days, they're okay, but I gotta feed them for 120, and those last 30 days, that's when they start porking out on me. But I have pounds to sell, but on the other hand, you know, sometimes those calves aren't genetically disposed to grow that well without losing some performance. So know how your calves do and who you're selling to. You may get paid for those extra pounds that you put on at greater than three pounds a day, or you may not, and so that happens. You gotta, that's where I like our, if you know the history of your cattle, that really shows a lot right there. Um, I think John might talk about this too. We have a website called Calf Web. It's a break-even calculator, and I use that for some of these rations coming up here. We got four rations. We're feeding calves from 575 to 750. We got 1.7 average daily gain, and this is the ration. 15 pounds of grass hay, five pounds of discrepant grains. Average daily gain at two pounds, so we got eight pounds of alfalfa, 31 pounds of corn silage. Got another example of 2.8 and then 3.2, and you can just see what the rations are. They just change a little bit. They're not balanced for trace minerals, vitamins, ionophore. Those can all be added to them. I don't care how you want to do that, whether it be a liquid supplement or a dry supplement or a, um, 
loose mineral in the feeder or a lick tub, which, whichever works for you. But this would be the overall average between these two dates of how much these calves be feeding. Obviously at 570 they're going to get less of everything and at 750 they're going to get more of everything. That'd be the average per day. Now if you look across the top, you got the, that first ration at 1.7, second ration at 2, third ration at 2.8, and the next ration at 3.2. Ration cost goes from 75, well 39 for the silage based stuff because you got a lot of water in it of course. Um, ground hay and wheat mids is going to be 84 and the hay corn distillage grains is going to be 90. Okay, look at the feed conversions. As you increase the gain, the conversions get better. Let's look down here at, um, let's see, I went to a different month. Um, for these, yeah, they came in at 570, went out to 750, but there's more days on feed since they got 1.7. So anyway, our uh, total cost, our feed cost to gain is right across here. Keeps getting cheaper as you get on more gain. You look at the break even, okay, the numbers change a little bit. Look at the profit per head, because you got less days on feed and the ration is a little cheaper. You could buy price protection for those at 38 I believe that's for uh, March and, and thir no January or March and 56 I believe is March and these are January and if you went to November it'd be eight dollars but yeah on that budget it looked like things can kind of work for 2016. So where do you get more? By pushing more gain into them. Okay. This is what happened over four, three years here, 13, 14, and 16. You can see where, um, yeah, the averages turn out the same way. Push them and there's extra weight. Now, I always have to throw in this one because I updated the slide in 2015 and went, okay, we brought the, give the same example. Okay, we said we were going to go ahead and uh, make $13 ahead profit, 45, 75. Well, the market all changed and look what happened, actually. So, you know, a good plan can always go, go awry, but um, look where they lost less. <laughs> Maybe that's the way to look at it. Anyway, okay, here's another set of rations for you. 600 pound calf, this one's implanted, using an for 2.6 average daily gain, 15 pounds of dry matter intake, or around 18 pounds of feed. Um, here's a ration rolled corn, or I suppose that should be whole corn now. You should process barley because it's got a husk on it. That needs to be broken open. And yeah, cost to gain 37 cents. Let's use the corn silage one. That one's at 28 cents. Um, corn silage and distillers grains, that's 27. You go over here and use the corn, the barley, because that's so cheap. Alfalfa hay mixed and some distillers to brush up the protein. And there's so many different ways to feed these calves. It's just a matter of you to decide which one's the cheapest and what you have available to it. Um, these are my numbers that I put together. And, you know, if you got two and a half dollar corn, that'd change all the numbers because I use 290. And if you got to haul freight to have distillers in, all of a sudden your distillers is going to be higher than what I had. So you got to do math in each one of these. Performance can easily be done in all those. But uh, I'll just summarize then my, my little back issue here that feed costs this year are relatively low. Cost of gains are 25 to 60 cents depending upon the rates of gain. As you increase the gain, your feed cost usually goes down. Um, all feeds follow the corn price and always remember it's a margin business so you always got to do your math and make a little bit. And, uh, we do have a lot of co-products available. So with that, lots of different feeds. If you want to do rations, contact Paige, John, myself, or your local county extension agent or agriculturalist, whichever the case is, and we can always help you do some rations on what might work for you. With that, unless you have any questions, I'll uh, turn it over to the next speaker. Yes, sir. Uh, one more question. Yes, please. How can I do that with the corn distillation? Put it in a shelf feeder. Put it in Well, <laughs> different feed cup, well, uh, cheapers. <laughs> Lots of different ways to answer that. One way is some feed companies have feed limiters. Yeah. So it keeps them more reading. If you want to pay for that technology, it comes at a good price. Yeah, it works very well, but it comes at a price. Um, I've talked to a good friend of mine who used it over the years and said, you know, did exactly what I wanted to do. I was very pleased with what I did. But other guys that say, you know, i got to find a cheaper way. And you talk about that. One way is you got to put them up, you got to work them up on feed. So if they've never seen a self feeder before, that first introduction of self feeder is almost like a death wish. 
unless you got something to keep them from overeating. Okay, so you crank down the feed so it doesn't come out as hard. You got to work hard at it. Well, yeah, good luck. Um, might work. Um, you know, um, my deal would be to bunk, break them, feed them in the feed bunk until they're up on a full feed, and then change the ration over to self feeder. That's my view. Not everybody has the time to have to do it. So you want to add some things to the ration. Put in like 1% sodium bicarbonate to reduce the acidosis in case they do overconsume. Put in Bobotec or Remensen to try to decrease their grain of intake so they don't eat quite as much. Um, grain in some straw so there's a little extra buffer so that they can't just sit down and pig out. Never let your rec your creek feeder go empty because that's, yeah, that's the one I always hate. You know, my creek feeder's empty. Can I just fill it up with this? It's like, seriously? Haven't you had enough dead calves to learn the lesson you can't ever do that? But usually what, yeah, so. Some things, maybe John's got control. magic in his fingers. No. The water freezes, so they quit eating for a day. Oh, they're yeah. dehydrated. You get the water going again. What happens to the calves? They go pig out. Got a dead really big storm. They don't go out of a little pole barn shelter until it subsides after a day and a half. They're really hungry now. They overeat. There's some management that has to be paid pretty strict attention to. Or know when to fill them up before after one of these events with some hay or fresh bedding or something, you know. Yeah, you can do it. And we've got projects that have used self feeders over the past years and and it'll show it's an easy way to feed cattle, but I, I'll, I'll just put it this way. Just figure in a higher death loss in your budget. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions for Carl? <laughs> All right, so Carl talked about a lot of uh, different feeds, a lot of our That's right here, feeds, John. and he puts together talked a little bit about, about wheat and all the wheat that we have out there and the ability to use that. And luckily, NDSU just updated this as of August of this year. So we have a publication called Feeding Wheat to, to Beef Cattle, and that's in the back, too, if you're looking to get rid of some of that uh, readily available wheat that's out there. Um, next on the agenda is going to be John Duvetter. He's right here in Minot, uh, here, housed here at the REC. So uh, Duvetter, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Paige. Well, Carl did a pretty good extensive job talking about feed and got into the budgeting, but I'm going to expand on it in just a little bit and share a few more thoughts on maybe what, how I see the economics playing out this year. Every year is a little different scenario of the fundamentals. Feed costs, market trend, cattle prices. <clears throat> we uh, have people who feed through them no matter what every year. They just background. That's their marketing plan. We have people who try to never, ever own their calves past the cow. They have commitments, lack of facilities, lack of feed base. And then we have others that try to look at the situation and figure the best alternative for, for the given year. In this year,